So I hope you see your slide and you hear me. Yes. Um, yep. So uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to give this presentation. Um, since I'm I'm the last one in the section, I will also skip uh, the um, uh, like the clearing intro uh, part because I think we have seen multiple very nice examples of that. Um, so um, my talk will also be kind of a summary of my recently finished PhD work um, because my, my postdoc project has uh, just started. So I will talk about uh, clearing and labeling for uh, Angio and uh, Cyto architecture as well as intrinsic cortical connectivity. But I will take them kind of in reverse order because my involvement with the clearing of uh, human brain tissue labeled for intrinsic connections already started uh, as a research assistant in Ralf Galuske's lab in uh, the Technical University in Darmstadt in Germany. Uh, and for those of you who are not uh, familiar with this uh, carbocyanine uh, tracing in human tissue, um, what you basically do is you take uh, smaller blocks of brain tissue and then you insert a lipophilic dye crystal into the cortex and basically every cell that is, or every fiber that is uh, connected with uh, the crystal will uh, take up the dye. And then the dye will diffuse laterally along uh, the cell membrane and also then the axon sheets. And so ultimately all the cells that are connected with the region in which this crystal has been placed um, will become labeled. And uh, this method is in, in human brain, the, the only really tool to uh, directly uh, visualize uh, brain connections with such a specificity and over distances of many uh, millimeters up to around about two centimeters max. Um, and it's also a very tricky staining because you, uh, for a successful tracing, you need very fresh tissue with basically as uh, short post-mortem times as possible. And uh, you should do this uh, special fixation here because this aids uh, the diffusion of the dye. And then you have to incubate your samples at 37 degrees for a really long time. And by that, I mean a really long time as in uh, at least half a year or so. Um, and uh, so you can imagine that I was very glad that these samples were already there when, when the project started <laughs> and I didn't have to prepare them. And um, you can probably from, from what you have learned already on clearing, immediately see that this is also problematic because the lipophilic nature of the dye will mean that all of these uh, dilipidating clearing approaches won't work. And so when uh, we started the project back in 2015, we were looking into non-dilipidating clearing protocols of which there were not too many around at the time. And uh, then we decided to go for the fruit protocol by Ho and uh, uh, Chang et al. Uh, however, when applied on, on thicker uh, samples and especially in human brain, it didn't really work. Um, and this is why I ended up adjusting uh, this protocol towards what we now call age fruit to improve the clearing uh, capacity, uh, but still preserving the lipids and therefore the, uh, the label. And um, here you can see that also in, in human samples, uh, the, the gray matter gets uh, reasonably transparent. And so this is a, a human amygdala sample, which is around about five millimeter thick on this end and, and almost seven millimeter thick on this end. Uh, and of course you see that the white matter remains uh, opaque, but since we have to keep the lipids intact for this approach, that's kind of expected. Um, but still the, the gray matter becomes transparent enough to image the preserved label in, uh, in 3D. And you can see like fibers of various diameter and also for instance, some cell bodies which are highlighted, uh, uh, which are highlighted by, uh, by the white arrows here in this 3D reconstruction. So I hope this can convince you that even though the clearing capacity of age fruit is more limited compared to these newer approaches, which we have uh, just seen, um, if you need to preserve uh, lipids for some reason, uh, this is still a, a valuable tool. And um, uh, currently um, what, I, what I hope I, I can do is to improve the staining or, or actually ideally make it compatible with these uh, delipidating clearing approaches. But also I still want to use the, uh, the original age fruit uh, protocol with uh, samples that have already been uh, injected with tracers uh, years ago and are basically lying, lying around for, for investigation. So I hope there's uh, more on that in, in the future. And then when I uh, joined Alad Rubruck's lab in Maastricht, uh, I quickly focused on solvent-based clearing because uh, one of our aims in the group was to process 
human brain chunks that were large and thick enough to provide good overlap with uh, ultra high resolution MRI data. And uh, when, I, when I say ultra high resolution, I mean, in this case, 200 micrometer voxel size, which of course for microscopy uh, guys is, is not too much, but for MRI people, it's really a lot. Um, and then for, for the clearing part, I, I uh, developed MESH, which is pretty much uh, an adaptation of the iDisco Plus protocol with uh, some tweaks and an additional uh, bleaching step and so on. And uh, I also um, invented multiple ways of labeling the cyto architecture with very inexpensive organic dyes, which are... Um, uh, yeah, also used in standard histological uh, and bright feed histological stainings uh, and um, which have the nice advantage that they also, and as we heard, penetration is an issue and these dyes seem to penetrate really well. Uh, and these, the first, the data here is, was still acquired on the LaVision Ultra Microscope, which also, we have also already seen. And I was very happy uh, in the beginning that we were able to acquire both uh, field of views um, that were large enough to delineate these different cytoarchitectural layers, as well as a resolution high enough to, individ uh, to identify individual cells. And um, in the meantime, uh, we have, of course, also provided samples for, uh, for the mesospin, right? And uh, in both of those systems, you can image centimeter sized samples such as this one, and this is uh, by we're still of one of my uh, favorite images of, of all of my samples. And uh, still uh, our lab uh, wanted to go even beyond uh, that. And, and our ultimate idea was to uh, process whole occipital lobe uh, sections. And so for this, I developed a pipeline to process these really large samples of many centimeters in size. Um, and we first embed these uh, guys in 4% agar rows and then we cut them on a commercial ham slicer, which seems a bit wild, but that's actually, um, I got this uh, tip from Susanna Herculano uh, Hutzel from uh, Vanderbilt, and this works really well. Uh, and uh, then to process these large slabs of brain tissue, uh, we developed um, uh, yeah, custom-made uh, clearing containers, which were um, uh, printed with laser sintering from polypropylene, and this, yeah, this first pro uh, prototype here was um, produced by, by a commercial company. Uh, and even though laser sintering provides you with a higher uh, resolution of your prints, like a higher quality, um, it, since our uni doesn't have a printer like this and the commercial printing costs were still pretty high, I tried to adapt this origi uh, original uh, prototype here to make it compatible uh, with fusion uh, filament printing, so your standard uh, desktop printers. And uh, for those guys who are familiar with uh, 3D printing, they know that uh, printing polypropylene is, is a really pain in the ass. And so I was happy that eventually I managed to do this. So now I can print these kind of guys here um, very, uh, um, yeah, basically uh, standard, uh, standardized on in my living room for around about 30 uh, bucks, as my quite annoyed girlfriend can attest. And I have also um, printed several versions of it. So I don't know if you can see my camera picture right now, but basically I've also printed higher uh, versions or also uh, smaller towers, uh, which were intended for example, for smaller biopsies or for uh, multiple brain, um, uh, uh, multiple mouse brains or something like this. And these smaller towers fit into um, common uh, 100 milliliter centrifuge tubes. And so with this, we are really able now to, to um, produce uh, very large samples in, in a high throughput and scalable manner. And um, however, now that we, uh, we have these, these large slabs, we also need a system that can image that. And I will only briefly show this because that's of course not the, um, the main focus of the talk, but we use our CTD SPIM here, which is this kind of system with an oblique geometry um, which has the advantage that in principle, your sample, uh, your lateral sample size can be almost arbitrarily large. And so in our system, that means we could accommodate uh, even whole brain uh, slices. And when I say we, I mean mainly uh, Anna Schütt, who is doing almost all of the imaging and who set up the system. And um, yeah, so you will see more about this hopefully uh, very soon. And um, yeah, then uh, with this microscope, we can now acquire uh, multi-resolution um, uh, data. And when we focus here on, on the higher resolution side uh, of, of the data, um, by the way, all of these uh, were uh, stitched with the Big Stitcher plugin. And so when we focus on the higher resolution data, what we are currently doing, we use the uh, Arrivis software, which was also already 
uh, mentioned to currently manually segment these different Cyto architecture layers. And then we also use Arivis uh, for um, uh, automated uh, cell segmentation. Um, and then we, we compartmentalize the segmented cells into the segmented layers to derive uh, cell cell densities similar to what uh, what Janice uh, just shown. Um, uh, one of the things that we are currently looking at, we, we look at uh, multiple tools, especially for the cell segmentation. So for example, we are also looking into Elastic or into LabKit um, to ultimately to also improve uh, the cell segmentation, both as like a sanity check, uh, uh, check for us, but also um, to, to make these, uh, these numbers more robust. And um, on the on the higher field of view, lower resolution side of our data sets, we have these whole uh, slices uh, that are uh, scanned, these uh, serial slices. And we are currently working on registering that with uh, our ultra high field MRI data. And in this case, we, we actually have data even down to 60 micron voxel size. And this project is uh, taken up by Johannes Franz who is a PhD student in our group with uh, much more uh, experience in, in dealing with MRI data. And again, also just as a side note, I have also uh, adjusted the original mesh protocol so that it is compatible with um, formalin fixed and paraffin embedded tissues such as this prostatectomy sample here. Um, and so also to show that it works with other organs as well as with this uh, standard um, uh, FFPE tissue. Uh, but this is uh, the focus on another project of uh, Anna Schütt. Um, and so, yeah, again, you will uh, see more of that. And then uh, lastly, I also extended the original uh, MASH method to label Angio architecture as well. Uh, and this uh, aspect of, of cortical anatomy is something that neuroanatomists often don't focus so much on. They typically focus on either the cyto architecture or the fiber architecture. But also when we, when we look at the, the blood vessel architecture of the cortex, uh, there are differences within and between areas. And so for example, uh, Duvernois here um, uh, proposed four general layers uh, of vasculature in, in the cortex. And, uh, but also other groups have shown that at least in some areas, there are some uh, uh, marked differences in, for example, vessel densities uh, in, within and between uh, areas. So um, uh, yeah, in order to look into this, um, uh, I set up what, what we currently call the Engio mesh pipeline, which um, uh, is uh, basically uh, took the original mesh protocol together with these uh, two uh, protocols here by Moray et al. and by Harrison et al., which use lectins for, uh, for vascular labeling. And I kind of blended them all together uh, to produce um, this uh, pipeline that can uh, simultaneously label the cyto and the angio architecture. And the whole thing takes about two weeks. Uh, and uh, yeah, so here you can see that um, uh, we can uh, stain both and, and it's, uh, yeah, it gives you very nice, uh, nice labeling of both of these aspects of cortical anatomy. And those samples were imaged actually in Zürich uh, on, on the mesospim with the help of, of Philip Bethke. And um, during the, uh, the image acquisition, we focused very much on uh, on the V1, V2 border. So here, this would be, uh, this side would be the calcarine sulcus. So here you would have the V1 uh, area, here you would have V2, and then the border would be round about here. Uh, and when we uh, zoom into that, I hope that you can, even just by eye, you can already appreciate that when we look at the vasculature of, um, for example, V1 versus uh, V2, uh, this kind of looks different. And especially if you look, uh, at uh, roundabout layer four, um, we, we really see uh, marked differences. And, and when we compare these uh, densities, for example, in the binarized vessel channel, then we, we also see, uh, uh, see those differences. Um, uh, and um, for instance, when we look at the orientation of the, of the blood vessels, um, uh, yeah, we, we again see, see several differences here. So these are uh, orientation maps of maximum intensity projections of the skeletonized vessel channel. Um, and um, yeah, again, when we look at the main orientation, then, then we can uh, see differences both uh, between the layers in one area, but also between uh, different areas such as V1 and V2, which nicely mirror what, uh, for example, Duvernois or Pfeiffer or some of these very early anatomists have, have qu uh, um, qualitatively described. Um, and of course, we, we are aware that with uh, these kind of vessel analysis, you could 
go almost arbitrarily in depth and, and you can get uh, can do much more sophisticated stuff. And this is why uh, currently Michael Capalbo, who is a, a system professor in, in our group uh, with a background in computational neuroscience and his research assistant, Hannah Hogan, are focusing on, uh, on the uh, data side of the, this vessel uh, project. So yeah, I hope there's also uh, more to come on, on the vessel analysis in, uh, in the future. And um, yeah, with this, I am already at the end. So to summarize, I showed you uh, ways for uh, the staining and the clearing, uh, primarily for uh, intrinsic cortical connections for cyto as well as angio architecture. And uh, in the future, what I would like to do, I would really like to develop a, a similar approach for myelo architecture, which is, like, which is the third big neuroanatomical thing that we are currently missing. And also, obviously, I want to make it compatible with immunostaining. And uh, yeah, we have seen already many, many approaches for, for how this can be done. So I'm very confident that we can get this to work with our MASH approach as well. Um, and, and another thing that was also briefly touched upon is that I, I want to remove some of the most toxic components, ideally from our protocol, and so further adjust it to make it a bit more user-friendly, let's say. Um, yeah, and with this, I'm, I'm at the end of uh, the presentation, and I want to thank all the guys who were involved with the project, and uh, of course, you for your attention. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Um, maybe I will start with one. Um, so your choice of plastic uh, for 3D printing, polypropylene, um, is it uh, in any sense better than, for example, nylon, so polyamide? Yeah, I, so yeah, I, I know that you guys uh, print from, from nylon, um, uh, polyamide 12, I think, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it's... Um, it's more of a consideration for me because, as I said, I, I really printed most of these things in, on my own printer in my living room and polyamide printing produces toxic fumes. Okay. So that's why <laughs> one mm -hmm. of the reasons, but also polypropylene mm -hmm. is really chemically resistant. So, <clears throat> mm -hmm. Sorry, so a lot of the, the normal labware like Falcon tubes and these kind of things are made from mm -hmm. polypropylene. And um, you can also recycle it, which is a nice additional aspect. Um, and, and yeah, so that's why I focused on this. Uh, I also, I know that uh, uh, polyamide works well with, um, uh, with the, the, let's say, the imaging solutions, but when you, when you do the clearing, you have to, the main thing is you have to get them somehow through the dechloromethane, which is the most corrosive mm -hmm. for the plastic. And um, there I, I saw that uh, the polyamide uh, bent quite a bit. Uh, I mean, it was still kind of okay, so I think it would have survived. And also even the, the polypropylene still expands a little bit, but... Um, yeah, uh, this is also why uh, the one of the uh, the big containers that I showed in which this tower is placed is uh, was um, uh, actually bought from Thermo Fisher and is made from Teflon. So Teflon is definitely compatible, uh, and the 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 smaller newer containers that are re these are really completely printed also from from polypropylene. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, we uh, will have a 15 minutes break now. Uh, I will uh, move to another building to Center for Microscopy and Data Analysis and uh, show uh, a little demo of Mesospin workflow on the mouse brain. Oh, uh, Nikita, there's a yeah. question in the chat I just saw. Um, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Uh, how stable are the counter staining methods you use for label neuron to label neurons? For how long can they last in the sample without quenching? Yes. Um, so, yeah, good question. So these uh, cyto architectures uh, stainings, um, they are really, really stable. Um, so uh, that, that actually is something that probably you know, Philip or, or Fabian can also attest because they have imaged some of my samples. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, it, it took a while from the point that I made them to the point that I shipped them to when they were actually imaged. And so we have we have really imaged those guys uh, uh, weeks later, and and we still got good signal out of them. Um, so the uh, this is this is really uh, not so much of a problem, um, and also the penetration not so much. I have more the inverse problem with these small molecule dyes that when I um, concentrate them 
too high that you end up with actually with overstaining. Uh, so uh, that's actually um, yeah more, more the inverse thing. Um, but yeah, we, we've seen that if you store them even at room temperature, just in the in the rims that you want to use, like in the uh, in the final uh, imaging solution, um, you can let them lie around for for weeks before you image them, and, and they still have good signal. Yeah. 